All right, Joe, you ready to talk about emotional intelligence again? Not really, but I got a feeling I'm not going to get out of this without it. So here we are. <laughs> All right. So yeah, first follow-up item from last episode was the assessment that I had you take, which I gave you the long version. There is a shorter version also, but obviously with more questions that you ask, the more valid the results are. So before I psychoanalyze you, anything jump out to you from doing this? Uh, it was really, 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 really long. Um, I got through it in a little over 30 minutes, and I'm fast at these things. Did you so... discover that there are keyboard shortcuts for the the options? Nope. Didn't. <sighs> I should have told you that. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It's all right. I did notice I can't go back. Yeah, of course I figured not. that out. <laughs> it's like, okay well that's i was like okay there's a back button but i can't click it why is there a back because your first answer it? is the best answer so you took away the ability for you to go back well, then make the back <laughs> button go away anyway side note i will say that whenever i got started i got about what was i probably 20 30 questions in and i looked up and the progress bar had like barely moved I was like what so i got about 100 questions in like oh Okay, I'm not even halfway <laughs> through this thing. Uh, so yes, there's a lot there, but I was looking through the results on it and it's got a ton that comes out of it. So I could see where there's a ton of value in this. I have not even had a chance to go through my own results in a lot of detail, let alone yours. So I, I posted my results on the Bookworm Club. I don't know if you want to do that. Did you? Okay, so I wasn't sure if you were comfortable making these public but I'll, I'll share mine too then yeah i made it public feel free to psychoanalyze me people like i sure hit me <laughs> <laughs> so what insights did you get from your results um if any there's a lot of things that i think i struggle with and a lot of those have to do with my own comfort levels around like how good I am at getting things done and how I communicate with that with other people. And this just showed me that a lot of it, um, uh, what am I trying to say? A lot of it is true that I, I do struggle <laughs> with a lot of those, but it's, I think it's worse than I thought it was. That's, that's my thinking at the moment. <laughs> All right. Well, to give you a little bit of hope looking at these, I mean, your results really aren't that that bad. Really? Yeah, for sure. And the other thing is like when people take this assessment, usually there are some areas that are lower. And I think I mentioned this in the last episode. The research shows though, because remember, this has been used over eight and a half million times, 140 sure. doctoral level papers and books on this particular assessment, right? If you focus on one of these areas and then go through a curriculum designed to develop that skill, you will see improvement across all of the areas. So since you've made your results public, do you mind if I talk about these a little bit? Sure. Go for it. Hit me. Okay. So your lowest area is commitment ethic. And the numbers on here really don't mean a whole lot because it's a bell curve. And they kind of explain that at the beginning. Yeah. So like one of these, I got 68. And we'll get to me in a second, but that's actually the maximum number you can get in a particular area. <laughs> sure. And I would argue, actually, that one maybe has negative repercussions, too. So we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> but okay. your commitment ethic being, you know, in the, the the first range here, the develop range, basically, that's the low end. And then there's a color to represent that. And so those bars are red. And then the strengthen range, that's kind of in the middle. And then the enhanced range, that's the high end. And then based on where you land in these different different ranges, it gives you a little bit different interpretation of your score and kind of paints a picture of where you're at as you go through those results in the instrument itself. Now, when you print it off, obviously you just get the numbers, but right. it's designed to help you understand it even if you don't have a psychology degree. <laughs> sure. And uh, kind of the reaction that I had the first time I went through it and also a lot of people have when they go through it is like, wow, this, I, I can't believe how crazy accurate this, this thing is. Really, it's not that that difficult. There's not rocket science here. It's just you've answered these questions about yourself. You've defined yourself. And then so it's helping you interpret what you're really saying about yourself. And that's why I gave you the longer one, because the longer the assessment, the more valid the answers. The shorter one, I think, is only like 84 questions. But okay. that's where you get sometimes some false positives and stuff. So... Commitment ethic being on the low end, that really isn't a bad thing because even though you've got a couple scales that are, are red, if you went through a curriculum in 
developing commitment ethic, if that was really something that you said, this is something I want to change. If you did that for a couple of months, you would probably see if you took this again, that it had moved all of the the needles um, in the direction that you wanted to go. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does make sense. And like some of this, like, for example, another one that's really low is stress management, which I've known for a long time. I'm terrible at that. But like some of this I know is changing right now because my work situation changed and I'm making exactly. some massive edits to like how I'm running my web business on top of all this. So I know that some of this is in the in the works of being edited already. Exactly. That's the real key here is it shows you where to make the edits. Now you kind of intrinsically, I think, knew where you needed to make some edits. Yes. But not yes. everybody has a podcast that they do with somebody and they read a book every two weeks and they talk about their accountability items and holding yeah. each other accountable to what they said they're going to do. If everybody mm. did that, there'd be no need for an <laughs> instrument like this because <laughs> you can't see your own blind spots, right? You right. need somebody else who's going to show you like, hey, you know, you've really not been yourself lately. Everything okay? Yeah. Well, this kind of shows you maybe everything's not okay. In fact, one of the uses for this, if you scroll onto the bottom, there's kind of interpersonal aggression, interpersonal deference, and then personal change orientation. Okay. So aggression and deference, those are kind of inversely related, which you can see on yours. Like aggression is kind of right at the end of the the middle or normal yep. range. And really it's it's more towards the low end. Okay. But deference is high. So you tend to defer. Okay. Now, if you have somebody who is terrible at stress management, they tend to defer. They are completely unhappy with themselves. And all of these other scores are low. Those are the kinds of things that can indicate that this is somebody who maybe will blow up and maybe there's going to be a violent incident. And in the past, you might just be able to say like, this is going to, this is going to, he's going to lash out and say something verbally abusive at work. Now it's, you got to worry about kids bringing guns to school. Sure. But that's the kind of thing, like if you see that in somebody, you have that red flag and like, oh, we need to intervene here before it gets to that point because that stuff happens when people feel like they have no other options. Like they they feel painted into a corner. And I know I am grossly generalizing this, but sure. eight and a half million times, like there's enough data here to show that that's kind of the process here. You can see the patterns, okay? Now, you're not gonna go shoot up a school, all right, but you can see that you tend to defer and that causes you some stress. So really what you want to do based on these results is the next time you have the opportunity to be assertive and stand up for yourself, you know, take a step in that direction. Okay, that that's kind of the the type of stuff you can get get from this. Yeah, which makes a lot of sense to me because I feel like that's an area that I've I've become aware of more so in the last probably 6 months. I haven't really spent a lot of time focusing on building out that area. So this, again, this, this is putting terms and numbers to things I, I feel like I've intuitively noticed, but haven't been able to truly focus on doing anything about. Yeah. Uh, a couple other quick observations regarding yours. Uh, your decision making is high. Your sales orientation and leadership is high. We added that term leadership because a lot of people were taking this and they they view the term sales orientation. They're like, well, I don't want to be a salesperson. <laughs> right. 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 And you probably maybe even feel like you don't want to be a salesperson because you're introverted, not extroverted. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So, but if you are married, you have sold yourself at least once. <laughs> That's what I always tell people. Yes, it's true. And if you have a job, you've sold yourself once. Yes, exactly. So sales is really not trying to get rid of used cars and <laughs> take suckers for every buck that they yep. have. It's it's being able to sell people on an idea. And leadership is being able to sell people on the idea that you can help them get where they want to go. So I, I like the fact that those are, those are kind of combined now. Um, your empathy score being high does not surprise me at all. Your interpersonal awareness score being high does not surprise me at all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> interpersonal assertion, uh, that is the that could also kind of be lumped in with the ones on the bottom uh, that is on the, the low end as well. So again, that just kind of shows like what your natural tendency is to to defer and well, I'll figure right. out a way to, to make this work. But as you know, that's not super healthy. And you know, we don't need to get into details, but you've gone through some stuff, which I would argue also contributed to the low stress management, low physical wellness scores. So could it be that if you're able to nail that 
assertiveness versus aggression or deference that that fixes all of the quote unquote problems that you you see here you know that's, sure that's the fascinating thing about this kind of stuff to me and i also wondered how much like physical health played into some of this as well for sure like there's the physical awareness piece which is really low on this like it's down on the red as well which in my main makes perfect sense because right now is horrendous for <laughs> for health and wellness in the world of joe so it made perfect sense to me cool want to talk about my scores i do because now i'm curious I, like now that i've got a little bit of background on this now i'm, I'm pulling yours up because i want to see this you're gonna make this public <laughs> too right yep mine are a little bit weird because uh I'm further along, I guess, on my emotional intelligence journey because it started when I was born in my family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if you were to look at this maybe even five years ago, my results probably look a lot more similar to yours. So one thing that really was a struggle for me was my deference was really high. And on this score, you can see that it's actually pretty low. Aggression is also fairly low. Assertiveness is kind of right in the middle. So I've come a long way compared to, you know, when I first took this in high school in being able to be assertive and stand up for my rights, but not trample on the rights of others. Um, the other thing that really isn't a surprise to people who follow me online probably <laughs> is like the, the drive strength motivation being pretty high. I tend to sink my teeth into an idea and then just make sure I do whatever I need to make it happen. Commitment ethic is maxed out at 68. <laughs> yep. Uh, I would argue that that one sometimes gets me into trouble because once I say yes to something, I have, uh, I can't let it go. I can't be the guy who just doesn't follow through on stuff. And that's to my detriment sometimes. Um, stress management uh, is kind of in the middle. That's actually higher than I would have guessed. Uh, it's been a pretty stressful several months for me, but uh, the fact that I am still here, I feel is kind of reflective of the fact that I, I have built in some systems and have some skills in that area where I'm able to mitigate some of that stuff. Maybe my wife, who hears me complain all the time, says says otherwise. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess what I'm saying is like it doesn't matter really what you go through. If you have the skills to cope with that sort of stuff, you can get through almost anything. So I kind of feel like I've been through almost anything. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this this score is kind of one of the things that's helped me get through that. Physical wellness also. Uh, this is this is in the, the high, high end or the enhanced range. Uh, and that was, again, based on some results that I saw here. I basically work out at least six times a week. Going to the gym, uh, now also cycling, so I don't mess up my knee when I <laughs> when I run. Uh, but that has been a, a huge thing. And now it's gotten to the point where like, if I don't get to the gym, it affects my mood. So sure. Um, or I notice that it affects my mood and I don't like it. So I make sure that I get there. Time management is also maxed out. I would argue that I probably still have some room to grow in, in that particular area, but this is strictly just viewing, managing your, your time. It's not saying no to the things that you shouldn't be doing or the intentionality effectiveness. I feel like that's kind of where I need to, to go to the next level with that sort of stuff. But yeah, uh, that's, that's basically me. Now what you see for the real effective leaders, whether they are big teams, small teams, whatever, is that, uh, most of these scales tend to be in the enhanced range. So they have developed these skills to the point where they can basically fit whatever the situation demands. Okay. So that's why I brought up the point last time, like, like if you develop emotional intelligence, does that mean that you're not naturally an introvert or you have to become more extroverted because kind of like the personality stuff in terms of, of leadership uh, and reaching your full potential to a certain degree, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> sure. Your personality is your personality, but you got to learn to manage it effectively. And depending on the situation, there is going to be a right and wrong way to, uh, for that to play it play out. So, so yeah, emotional intelligence in a nutshell. Yeah. I'm looking at these numbers. The only thing that's like, there's, there's a lot of numbers here. And I, I remember the quiz was the survey was giving me some explanations of where these numbers came from. 
Um, I noticed like where it's maxed out, yours and mine match on everything except time management. Do those max numbers change depending on the person going through it? Uh, let's see. So let's look at the raw scores. I'm 22 out of 24 on time management. You were 13 out of 24. So basically what that maxed out 70 is, is saying, remember this is a bell curve. So right. this is probably time management specifically is probably shifted more towards the low end in terms of people generally sucking at this, which is why sure. it looks like that bar sure. is, is maximized. But um, I guess technically, you know, 22 out of 24, that's not 100% in terms of my responses. Same thing with uh, equipment ethic. That's 23 out of 24. But because of the bell curve, like it's close enough that it basically is, yeah, it you're in the 100th percentile or whatever. Sure. All right. That makes sense. Well, I will say this was a fascinating process to go through. Definitely told me some things I was not <laughs> not aware of, but also not oblivious to. So take that for what it's worth. Yes, there was a lot there. I, I was grateful for having gone through this. So thank you for sending this to me. I have no idea the value of what you sent me. So <laughs> thanks. <laughs> well, I gave you, I think, the whole bundle. So if you wanted to go through and look at the curriculum associated with those areas, actually the assessment will automatically assign the lowest areas. And then you can go through the the skill building. There's a post assessment at the end, which kind of documents your growth. So sure. if you're curious, you know, you can continue to, to work on it, but otherwise, you know, you can be done too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking at the rest of the follow-up. We got a few things to go through here. Quick note again on memberships. We are live right now. So premium members of the Bookworm Club. Hi. <laughs> Hello. We, we're talking to you right now. There is a chat that you can jump in if you are listening and you are uh, have, a, have a point of clarification, you know, let us know. We'll, we'll be glad to try to answer those on the show. So let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, I added a calendar. Somebody mentioned uh, putting a calendar on the Bookworm Club. We'll put a link to this in the show notes, but it's on club.bookworm.fm. And I still have to teach Mike how to put things on this calendar. Um, but the thinking is that we'll try to post when we have a live show coming up. If Mike is up for it, posting when episodes will drop. Um, and if we do any other sort of thing going on, like I'll probably put Mac stock on it, like that sort of thing, trying to keep all of thing, everything that's going on around bookworm on that calendar. We should probably do the same thing for faith-based productivity, Mike. That just occurred to me. Probably so many things. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, let's, let's get bookworm nailed down first. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Oh, uh, fun times. Uh, speaking of Mac stock, that's coming up very quickly. Do you still have a coupon code for this? I do. Somebody asked me the other day, actually. So I was going to bring it up anyways. If you go to the Mac stock website, which I believe is macstockconferenceandexpo.com and register, there's no special link. But if you use the coupon code FOCUSED, F-O-C-U-S-E-D, then you will get $70 off of the weekend pass, which right now is $249. So it's essentially the early bird pricing. It's a good chunk of change. It's like a 30% discount. <laughs> so if you haven't bought your ticket yet and you're going to go, make sure that you use that coupon code, save a bunch of money. There you go. And come see Joe and myself. Yeah, we'll say hi. It'll be fun. There's quite a few folks going. I was on a call with a friend this morning. We were talking through some things about Mac stock. So yeah, it's gonna be a good time. There's gonna be a lot of folks there. It'll be a big event. It, it seems to grow every year. So it'll be fun. Faux show. Sure. Should we get into uh, action items from last time? Yeah, I have three. One of which you just talked about. Take the survey. I did it. I did my thing. Done. Good job. I also have been trying to pay attention to my emotions multiple times throughout the day. Mike recommended this app, Mood Notes. Um, I have to say that's been enlightening. I've been trying to check in with that three or four times a day and just note like what's going on, the feelings specifically I have at that time. I I'm trying to use it as much as I can so that it has more data, data on me. That I, sometimes I like seeing the results from that sort of thing, and sometimes it terrifies me. This one's kind of in between. Sometimes I'm really excited to go look at those. Sometimes I really don't want to go look at it. <laughs> Here we are. Yep. Mood notes. I like it. It's a good one. 
I like that. It's not free. I don't know how much it was, but it's helpful. I'll say that. Uh, the last one I have here is building optimism into my thoughts. I have a habit of focusing on the negative things and being critical of both myself and others way more than I should. I'm trying to give that a 180 and reverse that. All right. I don't know how that's going. So it's you going. pulled a mic and picked a action item that is impossible to measure, you're saying? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to think this way. I dare you to measure that. <laughs> Yeah. So here I am. We'll see. I'm continuing to work on that one. I still stink at it, but here we are. Like, it's still, it will be a thing for a while, I think. All right. You just had one. Yeah. My one action item was to identify the emotional fault lines in my marriage. And my wife listened to the episode. She said she wanted to do the the same thing for me. (laughs) Uh, I've been taking notes. We haven't had the conversation yet about these are the things that I feel cause stress in our relationship. But even without sitting down and comparing those notes, there have been a couple things that we have talked about because of this action item where something happens and I'm like, okay, so this is what I'm thinking when this happens and this is really stressful. And she's like, oh, didn't know you were thinking that way. So I'll figure out a different way to, to do that. Sure. Uh, A lot of it has to do with us trying to get five kids out the door in two places in a timely manner. (laughs) Wait, that's hard? I didn't know that. Well, it's hard, but we make it harder than it needs to be sometimes. So we're kind of in the uh, maybe identification or phase of that where it's like we recognize that when we wait until the last minute and then, okay, everybody get in the car. Like that just creates, that, that creates a baseline of stress. And that's usually when there are our issues. <laughs> somebody hits somebody and somebody's balling in the car, you know, as we're pulling out the driveway. Like sure. we can do a better job setting the tone and being calm and in control and moving people in the direction that we need to go. Like if we just don't be so frantic on our end, it has an amazing exponential effect <laughs> throughout five different five separate kids. Yes. Uh in terms of the the whole sounds stupid to use the word culture in a car ride, but that's kind of what it is. Like, I don't know. You can, you can feel the stress. You can cut the tension with a knife, you know, <laughs> when, when we don't do it right. And when we, when we do do it right, it just makes everything simpler. So that's one, ex- one specific example of, of something that is, has happened from this sure. action item, but there's more to come. I'm sure. Well, I wish you the best of luck with that. I know that kids tend to like, they mimic your, your, uh, like your attitude and exactly. things. So if you're stressed and hurrying and trying to get out the door, like they'll tend to do the same thing, but that has a tendency to clash. Yep. Yeah. They're, uh, they, they very much reflect what you don't even see yourself a lot of times. So that is a, uh, very keen observation. <laughs> All right. We better get into this book. Yeah. Okay. Ready, set, go. So, Today's book is Free to Focus by Michael Hyatt, and the subtitle is A Total Productivity System to Achieve More by Doing Less. So that kind of sets the tone for a systems book, which I mentioned I'm not a huge fan of, but I like this book more than I thought I would. So want to just jump right into it? I read this in two days. Did you? Wow. So you couldn't put it down. I... I couldn't put it down, and I I attribute that to Michael Hyatt being phenomenal at writing because he's really good at writing. I'll give him that for sure. He is really good at writing. What's interesting, though, is I, I had the same, same reaction. Like, I just want to keep reading this. But also, uh, if you look at my MindNode file, I don't have a single quote captured, which I think that's like the first time ever that that's happened. So he's a great writer. I feel like, you know, there's a lot of emphasis in the, um, the productivity. Like when you, when you write online, there's even like apps that try to get you to, to write at a, like a fifth grade level or something. So it's easier to read. I feel like Michael Hyatt did such a good job with that, that nothing was really memorable for me from like some specific phrase that he used. Yeah. 
which I thought was was interesting. I mean, it doesn't doesn't detract from the message of the book at all, I don't think, but I was kind of surprised by that. Yeah, I didn't underline anything. Like that's how I tend to do things is I'll underline it, make notes like in an in, in, in an index in the back. Uh, which is a thing I stole from from uh, Maria Popova and Tim Ferriss. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of people, it's a pretty common thing anymore. But I, I normally do that. I have none on this. And I think you're right on that. Another thing, a thing to point out is, and I don't remember where he mentioned, it was probably in the automation section about, or the delegation where he had someone else take a lot of his posts and the content that he's already written and compile it into this. Mm, okay. So someone else was heavily involved in getting this book put together, and then he basically just edited it later. Gotcha. Something along those lines. I'm probably botching that to some degree, but someone else was heavily involved in getting this written that wasn't Michael Hyatt. And for whatever reason, that really irked me. Like, it, it really, really bugged me. So I don't remember reading that, but that wouldn't surprise me. I do recall thinking Grammarly did too good a job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> all right. So this book is broken into three sections, as you do. And uh, the first and each section. Each of those sections are in three sections. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is the ultimate book of threes. So the first section is the first step in his process to regaining focus, and that is to stop. Step two is to cut. Step three is to act. Let's talk about these in order. So we'll start with stop. And because there's three chapters in each, I think we can crank through these pretty quickly and get the main ideas. But uh, we don't need, necessarily need to hit on every single chapter if we sure. need to skip around to, because there are some some chapters that have key ideas. Some uh, I feel were just like, he put it there because he needed three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, the first chapter, formulate... He mentions another list of three. He has three common productivity objectives. Number one is efficiency. Number two is success. And number three is freedom. I actually really liked this part. I think this is one of the strongest messages that Michael Hyatt teaches is this whole idea of productivity being the key to creating the freedom that you want. So he mentions like freedom to focus, freedom to be present, freedom to be spontaneous, freedom to do nothing. I mean, you can insert your own definition there, freedom to blank. But I feel like that is the big idea behind the whole book and is something that everybody can relate to. Yeah, I I see how I see how that could be a big thing. I mean, essentially he's trying to define productivity at this point. And I I don't argue with him. On that, and I think it's, and maybe this is what hooked me on this. He did a very good job of hooking me in this book, because I, my my sense is like he's not trying to. Oh, let me back up. When with this being a systems focused book, yes, it's systems, but at the same time, it's it's a higher level of system. Like GTD was ground level. Show me how to manage you know, keeping track of, I need to change this light bulb. Like that, that was the level that GTD was operating on, is operating on. This Michael Hyatt system here is at a higher level. Like it, it's along the lines of how do you go about deciding which projects and which areas of life you're going to be working on. Like that was, that was the level that he's operating on. So it's not like those two are competing like they definitely can work together and my sense is that a lot of these systems focused books like to go down at the task level and operate there not all of them but this one has a tendency to be at the higher level and that's where he starts off with this of like what's the point yeah of this whole book and the whole thing and it's a much higher level than a lot of the others that we've operated with which is refreshing. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And maybe that's why it was a quick read and one that I didn't want to put down because you don't really see that level of things talked about in this detail very often. Sure, yeah. Yeah, uh, one quick thing that he mentions in here under the efficiency is that smartphones have promised to make things easier and give you more free time, but they don't deliver on that. And obviously Cal Newport wrote a whole book on on that topic 
but I feel like the key idea here and is maybe a mindset shift for a lot of people who do view productivity as simply the efficiency is that productivity should ultimately give you back more time, not require more of you. My opinion, when you are focused on efficiency, you know, you're just trying to get a little bit more breathing room. The tendency then is to fill that space that you've created with your efficiency with more things. <laughs> And then you try to get a little bit more efficiency and eventually you are running so fast that you have absolutely no space. Like if you're going a hundred miles on the highway, you're following at a car's length, the person in front of you. And as soon as they have to stop, you, you crash. Yep. So the freedom, the space that gives you more margin, you have more of a, a buffer. And so things don't have to end up in a cosmic derailment of, of everything that you're doing. You don't have to drop all the plates. You just have to choose. I'm not going to keep spinning these ones. Exactly. Now you get towards the end of this chapter. Every chapter has like an action item with it. Like something you should sit down and, and go through and do. Did you do this? I started to. And then I realized that if I did do that, there was no way I was going to get through it in a timely fashion. So, uh, I, I downloaded the first form. I can't remember what it was because I remember looking at it, spending a couple minutes thinking about it and then deciding this is going to be like a hundred hours of work if I do all of this. So I'm just going to skip this. I do. I will say though that the exercises and the resources that he have with this would be worthwhile to do from a bookworm perspective, just getting the thing done. I kind of feel like there was another book that we covered where we had to kind of not do it the way they intended. I think it was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Where uh, no, like, that was, um, isn't that the one where he said, make sure you only do like one of these a month or something. That was morning. The one with the morning pages in it. I'm trying to blank on the name of the book. Oh, the artist way by Julia Cameron. Yeah. There you go. Could, could be that one too. I swear Napoleon Hill was like that too, where right at the beginning, he's like, this is the right way to read this book. Right. And so I completely agree that that is the right way to read this book. However, I did not <laughs> do all of that. Well, I did. I I did do all of these. It didn't take me as long, but it was partly because I kind of knew a lot of the answers to it before I got started, but I did want to go through it in the detail. And the very first one that I went to, <laughs> it did exactly what I expected Michael Hyatt to do. Uh, it required me to put in an email address Yep. in order to get the forms. And I immediately started getting emails for like, events and classes and something almost every day. <laughs> uh, that was incredibly frustrating. Uh, I get enough of this stuff and for that to just bombard me that much that fast was ridiculous. So I fully expected that. Um, that's kind of the Michael Hyatt thing. Like I, I get it. I'm sure it works. It probably brings a lot of income in for him. I just have a tendency to not buy any of it because it drives me nuts. Now you know how I really feel. That said, I did go ahead and download all the things and they were helpful. Like the the forums and things, they were helpful. I wouldn't say that they were, I don't want to say groundbreaking it. Like it's exactly what you expect. He could have said, like he could have given you a couple questions and put them in the book and you could have gone and grabbed just a blank piece of paper and answered those questions, and it would have been perfectly fine. Sure. But he he did this whole heavily produced and and formatted and designed forms to, to get where he wanted to go. I get it. I mean, if you want an email address, it's a great way to do it. Well, I'm sure those forms are coming from his free-to-focus course. Yeah. You know, he, I'm sure they already existed, and so that's kind of where he's pointing people. I get it. I do. Again, I'm not arguing that that's the wrong way to do it it's just exactly what i expected in that scenario again the form was helpful but here we are and it's worthwhile to know that that is the approach that he had when he wrote this this is not something that like i've got to get this message out there the message already exists in the form of a digital course and the book was created in order to sell more courses yeah yeah. So keep that in mind. <laughs> and that's exactly what it is. I mean, you go through it, it. You cannot get away from the fact that there's a course and a bunch of other materials that you can purchase around this. Exactly. I mean, it's exactly what you think. There's even, you know, a planner and a journal and stuff that you can buy that have all the branding and such for this. So it's exactly what you would expect in that sense. But that said, 
I'm rambling, complaining maybe. Um, at the end of each chapter, there are these action items to go through. I did do all of these because I wanted to, you know, give it the good, you know, a full run. And the first, I think, probably the first five or six, I did 100% exactly the way he was expecting. And then they started to get a little light on uh, impact, and I kind of let them drop off towards that point. I still did them, but didn't do them as thoroughly as I think he wanted me to. Yeah, well, I did them not at all, so. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, now that we know Mike didn't do it, let's go on to chapter two. <laughs> uh, I, sh- I should uh, probably defend myself at some point here and say that I, I kind of know where he's pointing with these because I have gone through, not in its entirety, but I have seen the Free to Focus course. So I kind of know where he's driving people with this sort of thing. And I completely agree that there's value in asking the right questions and getting the clarity of like, what is the next step? But yeah, that's not what I did. (laughs) Uh, All right. So next chapter, number two, evaluate. This is where he introduces the freedom compass, which is probably one of the central pillar ideas in this, this book, in this system. I have a couple of issues with this, (laughs) but let's just describe what this is. So there's this compass, and in the book, it's kind of offset a little bit where you've got uh, like the standard two by two grid, and you've got on the X axis, let's say proficient and not proficient. And on the Y axis, you've got passionate or not passionate. He just uses this compass to define these zones and he breaks it into four different areas or four different squares if you were to do the the two by two matrix sort of a thing you've got the desire zone which is where you are both passionate and proficient you've got the zone two is the distraction zone where you have passion but no proficiency the third zone is the disinterest zone where you have no passion but you do have proficiency and the drudgery zone is where you have neither passion nor proficiency Now, my issue with this is in the use of the word passion. I get it. He's, you can tell like he has spent so much time trying to get alliteration throughout all of this book. Yeah. Like the different zones, desire, distraction, disinterest, drudgery, like they're all D's, you know, and he's got the two different scales, passionate, proficient. Like I know he picked those because they both started with P, but I don't think passion really means what he's saying here and we don't need to unpack that whole discussion but just real briefly in in my my book in my course i kind of unpack the the root of the word passion is the latin word petite and it literally means to suffer so what he's saying like the desire zone where you have passion and proficiency these are things that you really enjoy doing that's kind of the picture that i get Whereas true passion is things that are really important to you. And the whole name, the desire zone, makes it seem like this is the fun zone. This is where you want to be, right? And I agree, you should bring passion into everything that you do. But that's the other thing is like, if there are areas where you don't have passion, there are things that you can do to apply passion to those those specific tasks or projects or, or even the, the job that you're in. You know, I think it was Mike Rowe of Dirty Jobs who said, don't follow your passion, but always bring it with you. Like, I believe that that's true. You can do that. And I feel like Michael Hyatt kind of touches on that idea a little bit. But if you just look at this compass, you get, it's very easy to get an inaccurate view of what this really means. Yeah, that's fair. I I went through this and like part one of the action items he has from the first is to write down some of the tasks that you would normally do in a week. And then when you finish this, the goal is to go through and like put your tasks into each of these zones. And then you go through a process over the next three or four chapters of figuring out what to do with those. Now, my, my first thought was, well, yeah, that's kind of cool. But at the same time, I was like, I'm not going to do this regularly. Exactly. Like, this is not something like, like I, I started trying to follow a lot of this entire system, which we'll get into in a little bit, um, the first week after I finished this book. 
And I'll be honest, like this is a cool compass, but I've not thought about it since I did that homework assignment yep. and finished the book. Like it's it's not even been on my radar since then. So I, I can't say it's something that's got long-term impact. It's kind of a neat concept, but it, for me, it just kind of stops there. Yeah. And ultimately what he's trying to get you to identify there are the, I would argue is the same thing as the three questions that I ask in my personal retreat course, which, you know, I ask those once sure. a quarter. I'm, that's as often as I check in with those, but what should I start doing? What should I stop doing? What should I keep doing? So the things that are in your desire zone is as Michael Hyatt would define it, things that you're passionate and proficient about. Those are the things that you should keep doing. The things that you should start doing are things that aren't currently on your compass that would fall into that category. And the things that you should stop doing are all of the stuff that is in zone four or zone three, or maybe even zone two. That's probably the progression there. Start with zone four, cut that stuff out. Then zone three, cut those out. Zone two, cut those out. Trim it as much as you can. Yep. Yep. That's exactly what he was talking about. But he gets into that in the second step of the whole system, the cut section. But yes, evaluate. I mean, he's talking about like paying attention to the work that you do and making decisions about what to do with those specific things and then trying to focus your time on the ones that you're truly passionate about, to use his term, and proficient, Mike. Like that's where you need to spend all your time. Yes. Which, by the way, we should probably define those real quick. He defines passion as work that you love that energizes you. So right there, like I disagree with that. Uh, but proficiency, he says, this is how well you do something. It's a, it's your skills plus the contribution that you can make, the effectiveness of what you're doing, basically. Did he mention Mahali in this section? That just occurred to me. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't have any notes for that. Usually I write down anytime anybody mentions <laughs> Mahali. But. I have that. Maybe I've mentioned this. I have a, a list of things like a book. Someday I'm going to write either a long essay or a book about books like a book about nonfiction books. And there's a list I've got collected of things that you have to mention when you write a nonfiction book. And like one of those is you have to mention Apple and Steve Jobs in some way. You have to mention Mahali and Flo <laughs> in some way. Like <laughs> like every yeah. single book has these in them. Like you cannot write a nonfiction book without mentioning these people or these companies in some way. <laughs> Yeah, talk about how willpower is limited. Exactly. Yeah, it's a muscle. You can you can grow. You can have a growth mindset. Like these are, yeah. yes. Anyway. <laughs> All right, so chapter three. Uh, so in this chapter, there really wasn't a whole lot that I thought was substantial. There is a list of seven practices to renew your personal energy. There are books written on every single one of these. So this is a very high-level and kind of pointless review <laughs> in my opinion. But uh, just real quickly, they are get enough sleep. Uh, Number two, make sure that you eat the right things. Number three, move. Number four, connect. Number five, play. Number six, reflect. Number seven, unplug. Uh, Did you get anything out of uh, revolutionary out of that section? This whole chapter, I mean, I'm, I'm in a stage where I'm very heavily focused on trying to improve my health and trying to take care of myself. So to me, this chapter, I don't want to say it was important, but it was interesting to categorize different types of rejuvenation practices. Sure. So it was it was interesting to me to see, okay, there's these seven different types of rejuvenating activities that I can embark on. I hadn't really thought about it in, in breaking down things in this way, Something I thought about, and he he kind of alludes to this, of trying to make sure that you're building these things into every week. Some of them are habits, like sleeping well, that needs to be a good habit. Eating well, it's a good habit. Move and exercise, those are habits that are routine-based. Things like connecting with other people, giving yourself space to play, um, and taking the time to reflect, like that's probably an area that I could improve on. But I hadn't really thought about scheduling time with myself each week for those. Sure. Okay. Like I... I hadn't gotten to that point. So like that part was of interest, but again, I also haven't really thought about this much since I finished reading the book. So I can't say it has a long-term impact again. (laughs) Sure. I feel like these seven things is regurgitating a lot of this stuff that I've studied in the productivity space the last several years. And if you've never heard this stuff before, I could see it being impactful uh, but just describing each one of them very quickly like he did, I don't think there was a whole lot there. 
Uh, I did think that his section on the rule of 50, which is basically the more hours you work past 50, the less productive you are in a given week. That was kind of interesting because he clearly articulates the old way versus the new way of time management, I guess, or just how you quantify your productivity. He says the, that the old way, your energy is fixed, but time can flex. And the new way, time is fixed, but energy can flex. And I think that's a really powerful idea. And I have definitely seen that myself where you have the time to do something, but if you are just completely drained, you are not going to sit down and create those screencasts for the course that you need to deliver by Friday. Right. So right. Uh, I feel like the way he described that was really good. It wasn't just like, hey, you need to manage your energy. But like, this is the way people have traditionally thought about this is that whenever you sit down to work, you're going to have energy. And so you have to manage your time. But a better way to do that is that the time is fixed, but if you can make sure that you have the energy that you need to going into it, you are going to get more done. You're going to be more productive. And so if you can put a cap on the number of hours that you're going to work in a week, whether that's 50, you know, the rule of 50 or 40 or 30, whatever, then you, and you approach it this way, you might be surprised at what you're able to accomplish in, in less time. I will say this. I met with, uh, in the midst of all my physical health stuff. I've met with uh, my main doctor now, the specialist that's helping me through things. And she has helped me put together the first four of these. So sleep, eat, move, connect. Uh, So before I read this, I had been in a process already of making sure that those were regularly something I do either via habit or by putting them on the calendar on a regular basis. The last three play, reflect, unplug. Six and seven, reflect and unplug. Digital minimalism really put me into those spaces pretty heavily. Uh, Probably play a little bit too, Mike. Um, Definitely the unplug piece. So that's why I say I don't think that this specific section was the piece that really triggered a lot of that for me because of, one, the stuff I'd done with my doctor and Cal Newport's book. Like between those two this was just review. Now, again, yes. I think your point is spot on. Like if this is brand new, which I guess this book is really geared towards people who have no clue with the productivity world. Right. If that's you, this could be very impactful. I could definitely see that. Yeah. I kind of think that even if you are brand new to it, there's not enough meat here to cause you to really take action on this stuff. Maybe there's a thing here or a thing there. And, you know, if all you did was start sleeping better after reading this book, that's still it's still a win. So I don't know. I kind of have mixed opinions on this. I kind of feel like on the one hand, why is this even in here? Sure. But sure. on the other hand, like, how can you move on without talking about it? So, <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I don't know. <laughs> that's fair. Uh, one of my action items did come from this section, though. So maybe well, I'm just uh, a big hypocrite here. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, as he mentioned, the connect section, like the people that you allow to speak into your life, the people that you're connected to, I recognized as I was reading that very brief section in here, and I'm not going to give Michael Hyatt really credit for this, but like as I was <laughs> just because you don't that, want kind to, of in the back of my head, because I don't think <laughs> I don't think he said this, but this is where my mind went was he's talking about connecting with the right people. You need to connect with people. You can't just be a hermit, whatever. I was thinking to myself, I need to cut out some voices from my life. So he's saying to connect, to rejuvenate. I am saying I need to stop connecting to the wrong things. (laughs) So my action item here is to do a social audit and just go through and look at who am I talking to going through my messages app, for example, and seeing like, who am I texting on a regular basis? And then asking the questions that really, I think I picked up from Jim Rohn. It's like, who is speaking into my life? What effect is that having or what are they doing to me? (laughs) And is that okay? Because I feel that there are some stressors there that probably have a bigger impact on my overall state than I realize in the day to day. And I want to kind of take stock of all of the different inputs and figure out how to minimize the things that aren't bringing me joy, aren't bringing me life, aren't putting me in a positive mental state. And I know I'm not going to be able to eliminate all of them, but I feel like step one for me is just identifying 
I don't even want to use the word toxic because there's some relationships like you can't get out of them and you really shouldn't. It's not truly toxic, but it is draining. It's not life-giving. And it's, I, I think, worthwhile to recognize who those people are. Please don't stop texting me. <laughs> you don't have to worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. So that brings us to the end of step one of stop. Step two is cut. And this is where we're referring to like that freedom compass where he was talking about the the different types of tasks, like the drudgery tasks, the things that disinterest you, the distractions, and then the desire. <sighs> Weird to me. But anyway, that that whole process, like taking the bottom three and how do you slowly or quickly get those off your plate so that you can focus on just the ones that you have both passion for and proficiency in? And the first step is the easy to say, the hard to do in eliminate. Yes. Say no, Mike. Just say no. Uh, well, I kind of have um, to a certain degree. I, again, can't share a whole ton of details yet but my work work situation is kind of changing and i've had to say no to a couple things and that's been difficult but i've done it and it's a positive net outcome i know that that being said even though i am technically following this advice there's a whole section in here about how to get out of existing commitments that i was like yeah right (laughs) it doesn't work that way not for most normal people (laughs) so I don't know. Maybe we should just talk about this. And I'm interested to get your perspective on this. Okay. So how to get out of existing commitments. He says, number one, take responsibility for making the commitment. Number two, reaffirm your willingness to honor the commitment. Number three, explain why honoring your commitment is not the best outcome for the other party. Number four, offer to help solve the problem with them. Number five, accept the fact that you will be misunderstood. So that all sounds great. But what if they don't care? What if they just want you to do it? (laughs) And what if that person happens to be important or you don't have the ability to to say no to them? Maybe it's your boss, for example, okay? You can follow all of this except for the key piece, which is actually follow through with the no. What happens when that gets challenged and you don't have the authority or the power to follow through with that? I don't know. And I guess as I'm thinking through this, There's a couple situations where I'm in the middle of something and we're trying to figure out what exactly this looks like. And on one level, I want to just apply this and get out of it, just be done. On the other hand, I kind of know in the back of my head that that's not the right way to handle this. This is something that I'm supposed to be doing. It's just we need to work through some of the kinks in order to make this work. Sure. Okay. So on the surface, According to the system, I have these things which are not in my desire zone. And Michael Hyatt would say, you should get rid of those. Here's how to get rid of those existing commitments. And then that five-step process, I'm like, no, that's not going to (laughs) work. So what do you do with that? You know, uh, I'm not, I'm not really sure. So the, the steps you read off were the ones of saying no to new commitments so was you meant to go through? No, this is how to get out of existing okay, commitments. Maybe I missed this. I was thinking the steps you mentioned, uh, we're forgetting out of new ones, but I know that like one of the big things I've always heard is like if you've made a commitment to something and you need to get out of it, the best thing you can do is make sure you have a solution for whenever you say no. Yes. Like who do you who do you send them to or uh, something to point that person to? Like that's always important in the process. But I'm not sure how that impacts what you're talking about. Well, okay. So I I agree with that. And if that's where he had left it, I would be like, yeah, I agree. That's that's good advice. But kind of underlying these five points is the assumption that you are able to say no and stick with it. And whatever happens is not going to be a severe negative reaction, which I would argue sometimes some situations that is going to be the case. Also, uh, he talks about 
in this section, I don't think it's in these five steps, but in this section, as he's talking about these, he talks about how you've made this commitment for this time period. (laughs) What if there's no time period associated with, (laughs) with the commitment that you made? I mean, this is talking about you made a mistake previously and you're trying to get out of it, right? So he assumes that there's these parameters regarding or around your situation that I don't think are true of every situation. So I feel like this advice is kind of limited in its effectiveness. Is this, this just occurred to me, going back to the very beginning here to the emotional quiz and you're like maxed out on commitment ethic. (laughs) <laughs> that could definitely be a piece because of this. I don't deal with what you're talking about here. Like, for example, if I make a commitment and then I need to get out of it, like I, I don't feel like I'm going to struggle with that. Like I won't want to do it, but I'll do it. Uh, I'll go through the process. Like, okay, here's who you need to talk to. This is the thing that needs to change. Here's how you can move forward. I need to step away. And explain that and explain the scenario. I don't really have an issue doing that. And I don't really see how that would be harmful. If anything, it would be helpful for that person to know that I'm committed enough, but I can't commit to that. And I thought I could. Like, to me, I see that. But I have a feeling that in this case, this is just pure speculation, Mike. Do you want to lay down for this? <laughs> um, this, this is... This is me thinking that, you know, because you have such a strong commitment ethic that maybe it has more to do with you feeling like you're going to let them down than it does with the logistics. Is that fair? That's pure speculation. I think regarding certain situations, you are 100% correct. But I also think that unless you are, unless you have CEO privilege, (laughs) there's a work context here, which is completely missing. If you are in a situation, you're, you have a, a, a job and your boss is telling you, you need to work 60 hours a week. But Michael Hyatt says, I can't work more than 50. Otherwise, I'll be less productive. Okay. So what do you do with that? If you can't say no, because otherwise you're going to lose your job. You know, there are other places that this plays out, but I think you're right. So thank you for the insight. <laughs> part of this is just me. But I do think that part of this is also coming from Michael Hyatt's perspective And maybe, you know, that's kind of who he wrote this book for. Um, And the people who are working in nine to five, they aren't his target audience. I don't know that, but that's where my mind went as I read this is like, well, that'd be great if you could do that all the time. But I can see a bunch of situations where you don't have the ability to do that all the time. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like he did call that out that there's sometimes when it's just your job to do things that you really don't want to do. Like that's every job out there. Like if you're in corporate, you know, a couple of the guys in the chat, I'm sure know that scenario. I've been back and forth with a couple of people here, but you know, there's, there's a number of things that come up, especially in corporate or small business scenarios where you just got to do things you don't want to do. And I feel like he did allow for that, but very briefly, like it wasn't massive at that time. So I can't say that, it's something that you like you can't get into a scenario where a hundred percent of your job is roses and coming up, you know, amazing all day long. Like that that whole Exactly. World. You can't just choose the things that you're passionate about, especially according to Michael right. Hyatt's definition. It doesn't work yeah. that way. Even he has to do things he doesn't want to do. Like that and he called that out. Exactly. I, I got the sense, but I think the point is to try to get as much of it in that scenario as you possibly can. Sure, sure. To help you. I don't know. Well, I mean, it I I think that this advice is is good. I just think that there's maybe situations where you're reading it and you're like, mm, can't do that." And again, for me, I think you're right that part of it is my high commitment ethic where I feel like sometimes I can't do that when really I do have the ability to do that. As I was reading this, that's kind of where my mind was going is how do I manufacture situations where I can actually use this advice? And there's a lot of other great stuff in here about like every yes contains a no, time is a zero sum game. You want to look at not what you're going to lose when you say no, but look at what you're going to gain. Again, I've kind of gone through that and had to say no to some things. And I agree 100% with that stuff. It's just like the blanket system. And maybe it's just the way that it's phrased. Again, this is a systems book, right? Right. And I hate systems. That's fair. (laughs) But Like, this is the way to do it. It's kind of like, well, maybe. (laughs) 
I did have another action item from this from this section, though. Oh, you did? Which was, uh, yeah, I mean, this whole idea is eliminating, right? So create a not-to-do list. Uh, I feel like I've done this before, but I feel like it's time to do it again. <laughs> I remember you doing this at one point. Are you going to publicize the stuff on this not-to-do list? Maybe. <laughs> we'll see what's on there. <laughs> do not text Joe. Social audit. Hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. Don't have to worry about that. <laughs> So that was the eliminate chapter, and then we get to chapter five, which is the automate chapter, which I have to say I was kind of looking forward to. I don't know why, because I knew what I was going to find when I got there, and I I mostly knew what he was going to talk about (laughs) when I got there, but I still wanted to go through it. (laughs) Basically, and the tagline on this chapter is subtract yourself from the equation. It's exactly what you think. If you can batch things and you can put things together to where things are very quickly happening or you don't touch at all you win like that's that's the idea yep he has four different kinds of automation here number one is self-automation this is where he talks about like the the rituals Uh, i thought this was interesting because you hear a lot of people talk about morning and evening rituals but also a workday startup and a workday shutdown ritual he introduces here i thought that was a kind of cool idea yeah that was that's one i've got an action item on i've done like the shutdown shutdown ritual a number of times I've kind of fallen out of it in recent months, but yeah, me too. This is where this book acted as a pretty good motivational tool for me overall. Uh, I've not really done the startup routine before, but I've been trying it over the last week or so. I seem to really like it. It seems to work pretty well. So I've been implementing that. Cool. Maybe I'll have to look at that too then. I don't know. I feel like uh, this really just comes down to habits and identifying the places that you want to, uh, to apply them. Uh, I feel like that's, Again, a very valuable idea that is glossed over very quickly. And under self-automation, I guess it makes sense there, but I don't know. Uh, the other the other ones here were really the ones that I was kind of interested in. I was kind of wanted to see how he was going to frame, le- frame these. Number two is template automation. Number three is process automation. Number four is tech automation. Now, Michael Hyatt has been on the Mac Power Users podcast a couple of different times. But I also kind of get the impression that maybe he's not as tech savvy as he projects, given some of the recommendations that he makes. Uh, I don't know. I kind of feel like if you're looking for tech automation, there's a lot of other places I would go first before looking to what Michael Hyatt does. Sure. Um, Sure. Now, that being said, like, how he's using this stuff I think is actually kind of cool. Like if I was in his position, I'm not sure that there's a bunch of other things like low hanging fruit that he's missing in terms of the tech automation. But for a lot of people, the tech automation specifically is not just about the efficiency savings. It's because they really like this stuff. So person I think of right away, Rosemary Orchard. Okay. She's loving shortcuts. You know, I, I know for a fact that she, uh, she installed the, the beta when she was over at WWDC, even though it says basically thrill seekers beware, like, don't do this. It's going to break your device. You know, but <laughs> she just <laughs> yeah. wants to see what's new. She wants to figure out how to make her technology dance. And that brings her a lot of joy. That joy is missing from this equation because really this whole section on cutting things, it's like, how do I ruthlessly get rid of the things that I should not be doing because it's not in my desire zone because it's not something that I am passionate and proficient about at. And for a lot of people, I mean, like there's a whole Rosemary and David have a, a podcast on uh, automation called automators. Like there's a, I believe there's a whole bunch of people who are interested in this kind of thing. And it's totally cool that they spend a bunch of time figuring out how to make a shortcut to do a s- specific thing even if it doesn't give them a whole bunch of of efficiency savings. And so I I kind of feel like this section only covers one piece of this and why you might want to do this. Email filtering software, if the goal is just to get out of email as much as possible, I'm completely on board with that one. Macro processing software, text expansion, all that type of stuff. Screencasting, that kind of gets into like the delegation stuff. There really isn't a, a use case for that, I feel other than you're giving somebody the same thing over and over and over again, you're trying to explain something or you're trying to delegate a task to somebody. So I don't know. It feels like a 
not very complete picture. Sure. Yeah, I could see that. But I also know, like, if this is a book designed for people who are new to it, he, he's mentioning things that are very low level as far as, like, I script things. I connect things via API without <laughs> UI tools. Like, I'm I'm kind of crazy when it comes to this stuff. Uh, but I think what he's talking about is kind of like your entry level tech stuff. So I know that Michael Hyatt has scripted things before. Like I've heard him mention that before where he's written Python scripts for things. So I, I'm hesitant to say he's not that tech savvy. I think he's just trying to make it approachable. Could be, could also be that the scripts and things, that's not his desire zone. That would be the distraction zone. He's passionate, but not proficient. Sure. So maybe he's trying to to cut those sorts of things, but I feel like you can't have it both ways. Right. (laughs) Either you should say, you know, I don't really do this kind of stuff anymore. So go look at what Max Sparky does. (laughs) Right. Or be like, okay, guys, this is really what you need to do. (laughs) Which, by the way, Max Sparky has a blurb at the beginning of this reviewing the book, like one of the testimonials at the beginning of the book. (laughs) I was reading through yeah. these when I first picked it up. It's like, that that says David Sparks. It's right. Like, wow, that's cool. So anyway, well done, Sparky. Yeah. You know, I haven't talked to David about that. I am kind of curious, though, if he knows that that's there. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true. That's true. Uh, anyway. Michael Hyatt is a marketing machine. That is something that he's very good at. <laughs> so maybe you should talk about how he uses tech automation to crank through books and create some courses and stuff, stuff like that. Give some context. I don't know. <laughs> All right. The last chapter in the cut step is delegate. Guess what you're supposed to do, Mike? Uh, I'm supposed to delegate, but I'm so bad at it. <laughs> uh, this is I, this was a good chapter. This kind of smacked me in the face. Um, He describes a situation known as time famine, which I've definitely been there, where you have more tasks than time to get it done. And then the solution there is obviously to delegate. What I really liked about this section was the five levels of delegation. So he talks about like a seven-step delegation process, which I don't know. I don't think that really is necessary to go through that. But the levels of delegation... Uh, I think this is worthwhile because the process may look different depending on the situation, but I feel like the levels give you a natural progression to where you are finally able to let go of the thing. This was always the piece that was missing for me. I was never able to feel like I could just let it go and trust that it was going to get done the way that I wanted it to get done. So level one is that the person does exactly what you tell them to do. Level two is that the person researches a topic and then reports back to you. Level three is that the person researches a topic, they outline the options, and they make a recommendation for the course of action that you're supposed to take. Number four, the person evaluates the options, makes a decision on their own, executes it, and then reports back basically how it turned out to you so you can figure out, did it work, did it not work? And then level five, the person makes whatever decision they think is best, there's no need to report back. That's obviously the ideal scenario. That's where people want to get to when it comes to delegation. But I feel like this framework follows a very clear progression of how you get there. Um, And again, I have not been great at delegating, so I really have no experience with this, but it makes a lot of sense to me. No, I think I like this section. I can't say I have a whole lot to say about it. I mean, I pay people that I delegate things to with my web business. So I I don't know how good at it I am, but I know that people don't have to ask me a lot of questions when I hand things over to them, at least in that space. So delegate things. It means you don't have to do them and you can get bigger. Go, go, go. <laughs> That's about all I got for that one. All right. Step three, act. The first chapter in this section, chapter seven is consolidate. and This is, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this one. Uh, There's this idea of mega batching that he introduces where you lump similar tasks together. And he takes this to the extreme by putting like all of one activity in a specific day. Like he'll batch record a ton of podcast episodes. He'll put all of his meetings on a single day. And I get that on one level 
when I was at Asian Efficiency, we used to have meeting day, except what happened was that meetings crept to other days. So <laughs> that's kind of the back of my head is like, well, this sounds great, but can you really 100% pull this off? I'm not sure. Uh, the one thing I do think that's valuable here is the broad categories of activities, the front stage activities, the backstage activities, and then the off stage activities. So front stage and backstage, those are basically the things that are related to working. And then you make sure that you have enough off stage time so that you can rest and recuperate, come back and, and give your, your best effort to building your thing. When you come back, I am kind of curious, uh, have you thought about this backstage front stage idea? And if so, what do you consider like backstage versus front stage tasks? Yeah, this is, I debated, um, cause like this whole chapter, he does mention like theming your week, like putting together your ideal week. That's something Michael Hyatt's been promoting and talking about for years now. Uh, I don't know if he gets into, he does get into like theming your days to some degree, which is like a whole Mike Vardy, uh, productivityist thing. So I get that. It's kind of cool. The whole front stage backstage piece, uh, I like it. I mean, it's a cool concept. I get the the idea of doing front stage activities on a certain day, doing backstage activities on another day. Like, I get that, and I can see how that would be extremely helpful. Um, I can't say that my line of work, like, that doesn't seem to fit real well for me. <laughs> mostly because I just have too many different kinds of tasks happening in one day that can force me to have to fluctuate quite a bit. And I don't really have a whole lot of control over that. So I like the concept. I just don't know how practical it is day to day for me. I haven't put a whole bunch of thought into this, but I kind of view this as like podcasting, creating that's kind of front stage backstage is kind of all the admin stuff. And I like this idea of the stages, but the more I think about this metaphor that he's using, I kind of feel like it loses its effectiveness. Uh, I think very simply, it could just be like creating versus managing. I forget who first came up with that model, but I feel like that's essentially what he's talking about here. Sure. Now, I, I mean, I, have you ever done this ideal week process? Yes. Uh, it's part of my personal retreat course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I do it once a quarter, basically, where I plan out my ideal week. Sure. I don't break down the stages, themes, and activities like he does, but I do put the big rocks in first, and I make sure that Friday mornings, for example, I'm going to do my, my one-on-ones. Yep. And then work fills in around that. Church is on there. Like all the stuff that I... I I know why I need to do that's the things that goes go in there first and then you know the the work stuff kind of fills in fills in the cracks which is not typically the way that a lot of people do it I think if you've never done it before that's the big takeaway you'll have is like well if I don't give work first priority and again that's kind of a privileged situation for you to be able to do that but if you're able to do that like you'll be amazed at how everything just seems to work when you don't make work the priority Right, right. I don't know. I, I've done this whole ideal week thing before. Uh, actually, I I remember, I don't know if it was the first time Michael Hyatt mentioned it. I used to follow everything he did. And I know that at one point he had mentioned doing an ideal week. And I went through the process of uh, building out my own. Uh, but I quickly learned that my personal struggle is to follow said plan <laughs> yeah i i'm pretty easy at at letting things go if i make a commitment to myself i don't it feels like something easily cut from my schedule uh or schedule um so that's that's something i've always struggled with i did go ahead and theme my days after reading this now that i'm working full-time at our church uh, I've been able to theme my days to some degree, like putting out fires on these days and building into new projects on these days, like that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, which kind of floats into the whole back office, front office thing. Like it kind of gets into that. 
but I I feel like I can't really schedule much more than the day themes because I don't really know what's going to happen. Like if there's an event in the afternoon, they tell me they don't need my help. And then they need your help. <laughs> but then that event shows up and 10 minutes before they realize, oh, we need an extra microphone. Yep. Well, guess what? It doesn't really matter what I have on the calendar. Like I'll step out of meetings and all kinds of stuff to go get that taken care of because that's my primary job. So Just called Joe. <laughs> yep, that's the way that works. So... I I can't say that scheduling to that level would work. At least not at that level. Like if I if I can pay attention to events that are happening in the building and such and I could schedule around that even, I could probably get there. I, I just don't think it's worth all that. Like it it, it would be quite a yeah. taking to get that all to work. Yeah, uh which is why when I talk about planning your ideal week, I do it once a quarter. I don't do it every single week. I'm not sure if that's what yeah. Michael Hyatt's advocating for. Um, but recently I did kind of have a revelation that maybe I should be doing that every week, uh, not to the same level, but just like I very quickly time block for my days at the beginning of the week, take some time and do the same sort of process, just a couple of minutes. And then again, like it doesn't have to be this is the gold standard. I have to make sure that I hit this, but just a little bit of intentionality and something I can reference when I look at, you know, today is, is Tuesday, for example, and my theme for this day is X and I'm going to try to stick to what I originally said I was going to try to do on, on the, that, that Tuesday. But again, it changes so much. Plans are worthless. Planning is everything. One of my favorite quotes uh, I really don't know yet how effective that is going to be, but I did commit to to trying that recently. So sure, I don't know. I'll, I'll, on that topic, though, a very important thing worth calling out here is that I'm not doing it the way Michael Hyatt uh, said to do it. And you could look at it then as like, am I following his advice or am I not following his advice? I don't really know. You could make an <laughs> argument for each, but I feel like that's the value for a lot of this stuff for a lot of people is you hear people talk about this thing and then maybe the way they're implementing it isn't exactly the same way that you should that you would implement it and be okay with trying something different which really is at the heart of why I despise all of these systems books because you look at it at a surface level and it's like just do xyz and you'll get 1 2 3 and save x number of hours per week <laughs> it's never that simple <laughs> there's going to be certain pieces of the advice that that's there that's going to provide a significant amount of value, but there's going to be other stuff that you're going to try it and it's going to be like, well, this did nothing. And so I kind of feel like having a very top level view of what this week entails. There is some value in that. I'm not going to the point where I'm identifying stages, themes, and activities though. Sure. Chapter eight, designate. I just wanted to say it like that. <laughs> I've been thinking about this for a little bit. Um, there are two things I feel that you can sum up this entire chapter with. Okay. One, do a weekly review and pick three things to get done this week. Two, do a daily review and pick three things to do today. I feel like that's the entire chapter. Am I right? Wrong? Sounds good to me. Okay. No, I think you're All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to, to clarify a little bit, um, in this section, there's really two different two different pieces here where he talks about the weekly preview. And I feel like we kind of just talked about that. And then there's the design your day. And I am doing both of those things with templates that I created for my faith-based productivity course. So not a whole lot new here for me, but if you have not heard those ideas before, again, this potentially could be revolutionary, though he skips over it so quickly that, uh, it's such a surface level approach to this type of stuff that I'm not sure how much value is here. I feel like his, his six different steps for the weekly preview is kind of ridiculous. There's no way I would follow that. Yeah, there's a lot in that, but you know, so we don't we don't need to go there. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot of things that could be in it that aren't, but you know, it's again if you're uh, if you're brand new to it, I could see how it's super helpful. But yeah, anyway. I'm good for chapter nine now. Activate. Uh, I'm not even really sure where to go with this. Uh, I have a bunch of like scattered notes here. 
He's got some focus tactics. Uh, he talks about listening to the right music. He mentions classical music and focus at will. Have you ever used focus at will, by the way? I did way back, like two or three years ago. Uh, it lasted about a week. Yeah. Then I got, I kind of got into classical music at that point. Okay, so do you still listen to classical music? Not entirely, but I do occasionally still, like probably once a week. I use it. Uh, Josh in the chat room says he thinks Focus at Will is awesome. So, you know, there's There's definitely... a lot of science behind it. Yeah, I get it. I mean, I understand why people use it. Um, it's just never clicked for me. That's me. I'm weird. I know that. <laughs> yeah. So if I'm if I'm listening to music, it's it's a lot of like uh repeated playlists that I've played in the past or like I think even Michael Hyatt mentioned like baroque classical music like that's what I tend to listen to if I'm not listening to just a repetitive playlist. Yeah, uh I've kind of shifted a bit. I've got a home pod in my office, so I'll tell the lady in the can to play typically some instrumental music. My current favorites are Night Drive Instrumental Edition, uh, anything Tycho, and a band called Utah, I believe. Um, I think it's Utah. I'm getting it mixed up in my head because they're from Kansas City, so I kind of want to say Kansas, but I don't think that's right. <laughs> and uh, you know, I just walk in and I say, play whatever. And I, I do agree that instrumental music makes it easier to to focus on the thing that you're doing. But I haven't noticed personally any benefit with focus at will versus that type of stuff. And it really just came down to, I like that music better <laughs> than the sure. focus at will stuff. Sure. Uh, I do respect all of the effort that has gone into focus at will. I've heard the guy who started it on, on several podcasts and the amount of research that they do and how they come up with those tracks. I have no doubt that for some people, that's absolutely the key that unlocks their ability to focus. But I haven't, I've tried to get into it. I also have a lifetime membership <laughs> to it, but uh, I've tried to get into it so many times and it's just never worked for me. I gave up a couple of years ago when the iOS app in particular was just complete garbage. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I do think that the music that you listen to is important and you want something that's not going to have words. So don't listen to bookworm as a podcast. If you're trying to focus on something, you should definitely listen to bookworm all day, every day. That's what you should get your work. <laughs> bookworm. Unless you're trying to do deep focused work. Then no, it's even with happen. deep focused work, like bookworm <laughs> is the thing. Like I don't, it doesn't matter what your work is. You need to be listening to hmm. bookworm. Maybe we should uh, sign up. And to be like narrators on focus at will and the dulcet tones exactly. of Joe and Mike can <laughs> help people focus. I oh, real quick. Somebody mentioned brain.fm. I I did get yes. into that one at one point. Me too, because the app was way better. <laughs> I don't remember why I did it. It didn't last long for me because I had found other stuff at the time. There's not a whole lot of tracks in that and I found them very repetitive. Maybe that doesn't matter. You know, I tend to listen to the same music on my HomePod all the time, but sure. whatever. Brain FM, I like... Oh, here we go again. Like it, it wasn't bringing me joy anymore. <laughs> so I gave up on it. Another one that I have a lifetime uh, membership to. <laughs> nice. Nice. Uh, there is one more chapter at the end of this. I don't know if you have more you want to say on activate. Um, well, I, I will mention that he has this metaphor of interruptions versus distractions. Interruptions are breaking in where distractions are busting out. I thought that was kind of a cool way to think about that. So interruptions, maybe there's nothing that you can do about it. Although he does have some, some, uh, some things that you can do, like limit your instant communication or proactively set and enforce boundaries. Uh, distractions, those are typically where you're on. You're your own worst enemy, though, and that's the one that I would argue people should focus on. You may not be able to stop your boss from walking into your office and saying, "I need your help with this thing right now," but you can control whether you get distracted when you sit down to write. And for a lot of people, if that's all the the if that was the only place you're able to make any sort of sort of gain, that would be that would be a huge win. Sure. Uh, I did have another action item from this section, which was to stop being other people's problem solver. This is hard for me, but I feel like I've made a lot of 
a lot of progress in this area lately, since I read this even, where when someone says, hey, I need your help with this, doesn't necessarily mean that I have to agree to take on the project or the the task. I can, if I want to, but I shouldn't feel compelled to. Like one example, I did this website a couple of years ago for this guy and I did it for free. And he contacts me out of the blue. It's like, I need your help with this right away. And I ignored the text message. And then he calls and I ignore the, the phone call because I don't want to set that expectation that I did this project for you for free. You're not going to pay me for the time that I'm going to spend on this thing. And really what he wants help with is like transferring a domain that he controls to somebody else. I shouldn't be responsible for that. You know, so I responded like a day later and I said, you know, I'm not sure what I can do, but here's what you should do. <laughs> and I feel like that was totally appropriate. I feel like the relationship is totally fine, that it did not hinder it or hurt it in any way. But uh, in the past, there was definitely a clear path to Mike being completely frazzled for about four hours on a Wednesday night sure. that I was able to avoid. And so I'm sure that there's lots of other situations like that. And I just want to not sign for those packages if I can help it. <laughs> that's fair. There's one more chapter when he just summarizes the whole book. There that's, is. That's pretty much it. I really have nothing to say about that one. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. Cause there's not really anything new in that one. Um, it, it's kind of nice that he wraps it all in a neat little bow and ties it up and hands it over. Uh, like, I it like says, that. Go by free to focus. <laughs> yeah, I mean, kind of. Uh, but it is kind of nice to to see the summary. Basically, it's the blog post that was expanded into the book. So if you want the full summary, read the last chapter. That's the easy way to do it. We don't have time, or I would read it to you right now. You could listen to me reading the last chapter of Michael Hyatt's free to focus book. Let's not do that. If you want that sort of thing for the premium members, go ahead and recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> Very fair. That said, you ready for action items? You have three. Let's I have two. It. Ready, set, go. I do. All right. So I mentioned all of these already. We can do this quick. I want to create a not-to-do list, things that I just either don't want to do or shouldn't be doing anymore. I want to do a social audit and figure out which are the people that I talk to that give me energy and which are the people that take energy. And then I want to stop being other people's problem solvers. That's the big, vague, general one that you're not going to be able to hold me accountable to. Yeah. But like I said, I've already had a win with that. So uh, I've all, all that action item is already worth it. Sure. Uh, my two, you can definitely keep me accountable on these. But there's two of them. They follow the same pattern. Schedule and follow a startup routine for the mornings and a communication routine three times daily. So... Startup routine, pretty simple. A list of things I run through whenever I first get to the office. And then a communication routine, which in the morning follows that startup routine. And then midday and end of the day. So the goal is to give me points when I'm cranking through email and such uh, where I can get caught up on that without having it open all day long. Because we all know email open all day long is how you get lots done. False. So, <laughs> right. Scheduling On that it topic, is the way to go. <laughs> I was I was looking at my my timing data the other day cuz I always have thought like I don't spend a whole lot of time in email, but I wonder how much time I do spend in email. Oh, sure. Last week I spent 27 minutes in email. <laughs> 27 minutes? I spend that in like one sitting. Yeah. <laughs> That's nuts, well, dude. I'm also a little bit behind, but uh, I feel kind of vindicated by those statistics. It's like, yeah, it is possible. You know, I I should be spending a little bit more time. There are definitely some people I need to respond to, but I've also feel like I've kind of set the expectations regarding email. So I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people are furious waiting for me to get back to them. But I easily spend an hour to an hour and a half every day. Easily go email. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How are you gonna rate this? Style and rating. You want me to go first, eh? I do. It's your book. Go. I am very conflicted about this book. <laughs> you read it fast. Uh, I did read it fast. It was an entertaining read. Actually, you know another reason why? 
this was such a fast book is because like every five pages, he has a full page graphic with like one sentence on it. <laughs> yes. Yes. So even though the book is, let's see, 220 some pages, it's probably like 160 pages of actual text. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I also skipped the action items. So that's fair. I don't know. I, I mentioned at the beginning that I enjoyed this book a lot more than I thought I would. I was ready to just completely rail on this thing. But I feel like there's a lot of good stuff here. I'm trying to disconnect my perspective with what I feel is a very shallow overview of a lot of very important topics. Um, not able to do that completely effectively. I do think that if you are just looking for an introductory type book that's going to focus on the intentional aspect of productivity and not just the efficiency, this is a great book. Uh, I don't think there was anything in here that was particularly life-changing for me. And I don't think there is anything even for people who are just getting into this space. I feel like it's a great introduction. You'll have a solid grasp of a lot of the concepts that are important, but you won't have any like real aha moments that are going to profoundly impact your life five years from now. So uh, it is what it is. And I think it's a very good introductory book uh, on the topic of focus. And I'm going to give it four stars. Four stars, huh? Okay. Yep. So again, I read this in two days. I, I had a hard time putting it down. Michael Hyatt's a great writer in that sense. So as far as ease of reading, it's easy. <laughs> it's it's very yep. easy to pick up. It's hard to put back down. So kudos to Mike on that one. You know, I part of that is because I really, really liked this as basically a motivational book. Like it's it's pitched as a productivity system and a productivity book, but I really liked it as a motivational book instead. But that's partly because like he didn't teach me any tactics here I didn't already know did he put a system together that I wasn't aware of not really like they're all just pieces that you can pick out from different places can you get one piece without the other yeah absolutely so I don't think his system per se is something that I'm going to go around recommending um call I don't even know what you f2 maybe I don't know free to focus but the because you know systems always have to have the acronyms GTD F two like whatever, um, <laughs> like I, I don't really see that happening, but I I would say like if you're brand new to productivity, this is a good one to pick up and get started with. If you've been in productivity for a long time, I think this is still a good one to pick up because it's it is it, kind of inspiring to keep going with what you're doing and maybe tweak it. Like obviously we've got five action items here from a book that is full of things that we already know. Like <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Like that's it's yep. not something that's completely groundbreaking, but at the same time I think there's a lot of value in it. So I'm with you in that I'm I'm a little bit torn on how to rate it because there's not anything that completely stood out to me, but I also have a hard time seeing how this is not a like this book would be helpful to pretty much anyone who picked it up. So I'm going to put it at a 4.5. All right. Because I, I, I think there's a lot of motivational um, value in this. Again, it's I had a hard time putting it down. I, I mean, we're, we're ripping on it here and there. But I think overall, I do think it's a good book. I think it's a it's a good one to, to pick up and read. So, yeah, I'll recommend it and I'll put it at a 4.5. All right. Well, I do think it is a good book also. And I think that the discussion of the style and rating has just determined what I'm going to pick next for an upcoming book. Okay. All right. So you're first on the outline. So yes, next one up. I picked this one up at a like a thrift store of sorts. Bird by Bird and Lamont. This is one that's pretty well known in writing circles. Um, some instructions on writing and life. And there's actually a quote from this book in Michael Hyatt's Free to Focus too. So I'm excited about this one. I've wanted to read, read this one for a long time. So... And someone recommended it after I mentioned it on the last episode on the club. I thought that was kind of cheating, but, <laughs> you know, here we are. Yeah. So speaking of the club, there's another book which has a 
actually it's the highest rated book that we have not covered. Okay. And that is Make Time, How to Focus on What Matters Every Day, which is actually something that I read as a gap book not too long ago by Jake Knapp and John Zaratsky. Okay. This is on the complete other end of the spectrum from Michael Hyatt's Free to Focus, and it's on the same topic. <laughs> so Okay. This is, uh, for, first of all, I don't know which one of these guys is the illustrator, but there's a lot of really cool uh, illustrations in this book. It's a very easy read, very entertaining read. I want to get your perspective on this book versus the Michael Hyatt Systems book and see which one you you like better since you rated Free to Focus so high. Okay. Um, this is something that I first heard about on Focused episode 70, I think it was, with Shahid. Uh, he mentioned this book to me. There's the concept of the infinity pools. That's where this book comes from, or that's sure. what comes one of the things that comes from this book. So I don't know. I feel like this is just the perfect follow up conversation to the one okay. we're having right now. Maybe I'll regret putting it at a 4.5. We'll see. <laughs> I think 4.5 is completely fair. So I it's put right. it at four. I have a gap book this time, Mike. All right. What is it? I'm excited. I had I had one kind of last week. All marketers are liars by Seth Godin. Uh, very fascinating. I have always enjoyed Seth Godin. Uh, been a while since I've read one of his books. So yeah, I've really enjoyed it. It's a, it's a good one. Seth is just a brilliant guy. Um, I heard him speak at Entree Leadership. Somebody said that he was at Craft and Commerce, which I got to go to, by the way, uh, last weekend as we record this. Oh, right. Uh, somebody said he was there as an attendee. I didn't actually see him, but yeah, he's... He's the kind of guy where you hear him speak and you're you're just instantly in awe of the fact that he is by far the smartest person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter who else is there. <laughs> so true. So true. Uh, I've also got a gap book. Uh, forget where we last talked about it, but I've kind of in the back of my head had this on my radar ever since we were talking about the whole concept of honor. There is a book in my collection, which I haven't read now in several years, but I want to read it again, called Honor Found by Robert Berger. And it's on the topic of of honor and why it's important and what it is and how to implement it effectively, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's my gap book. Cool. Cool. Well, Bird by Bird is now a recommendation after I mentioned it. Uh, Make Time is a book recommendation. So if you have one, obviously we're picking books from that list. You know, let us know. What is it you would like to hear us go through? Club.bookworm.fm. Click the recommend button. Fill out. Give us a link. Tell us about it. Get it on the list. And vote for it. Make sure you vote for it. It's very important. And you can vote for other books there too as well. Uh, Again, you can find that full list of recommendations on the club. You can find all the ones that we've... Uh, gone through already the ones that are upcoming like you can find those all on the club as well but you can also find them on bookworm.fm slash list that's that's where you'll find those as well cool uh we also want to hear your action items joe and i post ours to the the bookworm club but put yours there as well if you want other people to hold you accountable a lot of times by the way just a random side note on this you don't even need people who are going to follow up with you. Sometimes just the act of publicly declaring that you're going to do a thing can be the motivation that you need to follow through and do it. So yep. if that's the thing that makes it work for you, go ahead and do that. We, we we don't mind. We love to see how other people are implementing the stuff that they they learn, the stuff that they read. For sure. Uh, also mention that there's a couple different ways that you can support the show. Number one, you can join the revolution, take down KCRW, go to iTunes and leave us a review. Number two, we do have the premium membership where we are recording this live and apologies to all the people who are listening live with the tech issues that we had, but uh, it's it's fun. And I think it gives a little bit different perspective than the polished produced version that you get in your podcast catcher. Uh, that is five bucks a month. You can find out how to sign up for that by going to bookworm.fm slash membership. In addition to listening live, you also get the book notes for all the mind node files. I've mentioned a couple different things from my mind node today. So that's going to go up on the, the club when this episode goes out as well. Cool. Cool. Well, if you are reading along with us, I know there are a few of you that do that. 
Uh, we're going into the national bestseller, the one and only Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. I'm looking forward to this one, and we will go through that one next time.